Hello, this is Fred Haight speaking, and I am going to integrate three things into this presentation. One, dramatic readings aloud of certain sections of Yenner's essay where he communicates the unique things that he learned as a composition student of Brahms. Two, discoveries made by myself and others over the decades. And three, musical examples in an attempt to make everything clear. These three efforts are meant to be complementary to one another, and I trust and hope that you will find them to be so. Nevertheless, I will distinguish my statements from Yenner's by employing our respective initials underneath those statements. One of my great passions in life is to see the revival of classical artistic composition, especially musical composition, and I will do everything in my power to assist the young composer, him or her, in accomplishing that shared mission. Some of my listeners may object and say that classical music has no need of revival. There are plenty of good pieces being written today. And I'll be the first to admit that I have heard some decent pieces, especially choral ones, but I think we're really fooling ourselves if we think we are anywhere close to the standards set by the period of Bach through Brahms. Those historical standards, though, are the ones that we have to meet because the future requires it of us. Why does the future require that level of classical culture? Because music is neither entertainment nor merely a matter of personal taste. Music addresses the human mind at its highest level, the cognitive level, where scientific discoveries are made and where creativity takes place. The greatest musical compositions are scientific discoveries, but they're also creative. Scientific discovery and creativity are not contradictions in terms. Music also addresses human emotion at its highest level. Perhaps there is no other art in which reason and emotion are so closely wed as they are in music. In music, reason and emotion educate one another. In what the poet Schiller would term the instinct for play, they gently tease, cajole, prod one another upwards to better discoveries and to more pure levels of both thought and feeling. Though reason and emotion never abandon their independent identities, they do become as one in a certain way because the harmony between them increases as their dissonances are resolved. Thus, the most beautiful music reaches inside of our souls and addresses our very identities, our deepest sense of who we really are, and even helps us change who we really are. For the better. When perverted though, music can also address the bestial side of man in a way that would scarcely have been thought possible in Brahms' time. In order to invoke this level of beauty, music must avoid the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time which says, party on, hop on the bandwagon, good have a good time, be popular, do what everybody else is doing unless you want to seem square or weird or out of touch. But what does it mean to be in touch? There are websites dedicated to the hottest women in classical music. Some may see nothing wrong with this. Others who do may protest and say, well, their designer clothes, they're modest by standards, and besides, the women don't really have to go along with it. Try getting an album published today if you're even the most talented female musician if you're not willing to appear sexy. Could Clara Schumann get an album published today? One of the best tools I have found to assist the young composer is a short essay by Gustav Jenner called Johannes Brahms as Man, Artist, and Teacher. Who is Jenner? 
he was a composition student of Brahms. Not only that, he was Brahms' only composition student. In part two, I will quote Jenner much more and address some of the historical issues involved, including the battle between the Brahmsian and Wagnerian camps over ideas of musical composition, and I also will try to replicate some of the principles that Brahms sought to instill in the young Jenner as an aspiring composer. I will also address how Jenner saw the difference between Brahms and Tchaikovsky. But right now, in part one, I am going to address something that lies at the heart of Jenner's report and something that is not well understood today at all. The relationship between literate spoken language, such as classical poetry, and musical composition. Classical poetry was the wellspring of inspiration for so many composers, emphatically including Schubert, Schumann, and Brahms, pictured here in his library. Lyndon LaRouche once referred to Lied, the setting of classical poetry as song, as the Rosetta Stone of music. What was the Rosetta Stone? In the 19th century, Egyptian hieroglyphics remained indecipherable. There was nothing it could be related to in any known language. The Rosetta Stone bore a decree issued by a pharaoh in three different languages, one of which was hieroglyphics and one of which was ancient Greek. Since they all said the same thing, that allowed the linguist Champollion to decipher hieroglyphics for the first time. The interface between hieroglyphics and ancient Greek was key. Similarly, Lied, the setting of classical poetry to music, may provide the Rosetta Stone for music as the interface between classical poetry and classical music. The setting of poetry was the wellspring of inspiration for so many composers, emphatically including Schubert, Schumann, and Brahms. Here is Brahms pictured in his personal library which was stuffed with volumes of poetry, including poems sent by personal admirers in the hopes that he would set them. Jenner wrote that he knew from personal knowledge that Brahms had read everything sent to him, no matter how bad. But if Lied is the Rosetta Stone for classical musical composition, it may be even more so for poetry the reciting of which and the writing of which is pretty much a lost art today. If and when people think about poetry these days, what's the image they might have? Dreamy lovers sitting in a field oblivious to all reality? Coffee houses? Beatniks? Hippies of the 1960s? Perhaps presidential inaugurations where surely the poet must be saying something important? In those rare cases where poetry is recited today, whether classical or modern, it is recited as prose. A disguised prose, perhaps, hiding behind a certain exaggerated declamation and obfuscation of meaning. But when you break it down, it's prose. You might expect our modern poets to deliver something more metaphorical, but when you look at it, it's even more base prose. The musical aspects of poetry have largely been abandoned. The same Lyndon LaRouche also insisted that a poem is a score. Not so specific that there's only one possible setting of the poem, but there are certain guidelines, musical guidelines, contained within the poem itself that must be followed if the composer is to be true to the poem. Let's begin by examining one aspect of the musicality of poetry, meter. You may recall in school studying poetic meter with a terrible thing called scansion. You took a line in iambic pentameter, and nobody had any idea what that meant, and recited it like this. 
da 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 No wonder we all hated poetry in school. We can learn a lot about the musical aspects of poetry by examining how great composers set the same poem. And from that we can learn backwards something about how a literate person in the 19th century might have read that poem out loud. A very useful example is Goethe's short poem Kennst du das Land. A young girl expresses to her mentor her desire to return to her native Italy. The first two lines go as follows, and please excuse my poor German. Kennst du das Land, wo diese Thronen blühen? In dunklen Laub, die gold Aragon blühen? Do you know the land where lemon blossoms grow? In darkest vales, the golden oranges glow. So let's compare settings of this poem, just those two lines, by three great masters. First, Beethoven. Next, Schubert. And finally, Schumann. How much is there to be learned in a simple comparison of just these two lines by three great composers? They're very different compositions, but they all follow certain universalities determined by the poem itself. If we were to recite these two lines according to the musical scansion taught in schools, even at its best it would sound like Kennst du das Land, wo die Citronen in Blum? In dunkeln Lau die Gold orangen Blum. I am neither a German speaker nor a reciter of poetry, but a comparison of the three settings convinces me that all three composers had at least a metrical reading of these two lines, something along the lines of this. Kennst du das Land, wo die Citronen Blum? In dunkeln Lau Die gold this helped me understand what a fraud scansion is taught in schools really is. It's a Procrustean bed. In Greek mythology, Procrustes, rather than build a bed to fit his visitors, would either chop limbs off the visitors or stretch them out in order to fit the bed. Thus we are required to lengthen and shorten syllables to fit into a pre-existing form outside of the poem we are actually reciting. The metrical reading of the line is not determined by some outside formula, but by what is going on in the poem itself, including the fact that a question is being asked and that it's a young person asking it. Also, it begins on a strong verb, kennst. So, it cannot possibly be pronounced kennst du das Land, but has to be kennst du das Land, and every one of these composers does that. All three also draw out the vowel O on Citronen. We'll come to vowels in a bit. In part two, we will discover how 
sonata form as a mere form cookie cutter plays a similar role as a Procrustean bed. It's beyond the scope of this report, but if you examine the setting of an entire stanza by the same three composers of this poem, you will find that they all pick the same points for changes in time signature and changes in key. Not necessarily the same time signatures or same keys or relation of keys, but the same points of change as determined by the poem. The English poet John Milton satirized Scansion in a poem dedicated to the English musician Henry Laws. A few words of explanation are necessary. When Milton refers to Midas ears, he's referring to the Greek mythical story of King Midas, who in judgment of a competition, musical competition, preferred the music of the donkey god Pan to that of the actual god Apollo. Apollo's response was to merely say, well, <laughs> if your hearing's that bad, you don't deserve human ears, we'll give you donkey ears, and that's what he did. So, when Milton refers to Midas ears, he's essentially indicating that when we recite poetry in strict scansion, school book scansion, we are braying like a donkey. My reading may be a bit exaggerated, but I want to make Milton's point. Harry, whose tuneful and well-measured song first taught our English music how to span words with just note and accent, not to scan with Midas ears, committing short and long. Thy worth and skill exempt thee from the throng. Does that mean we throw out poetic meter in favor of blank verse? Not at all. It means we increase the importance of poetic meter. I am indebted to Edgar Allan Poe, who in his rationale of verse first made clear to me the equivalence between poetic meter and musical meter. For Poe, the long syllable in a poetic foot must last for exactly twice the amount of time as the short syllable. Therefore, each foot in a poem would occupy exactly the same amount of time, just as does a measure in music. What a revelation that was. Scansion is usually presented in English poetry as a matter of stressed and unstressed syllables rather than long and short syllables, and a number of scholars have objected quite strongly to Poe's insistence on this musical quality. Poe says quite humorously in that essay that the reason that a thousand profound scholars had never undercovered the simple truth were threefold. One, they were a thousand. Two, they were profound. And three, they were scholars. Poe looked all the way back to Greek and Latin poetry in order to discover these matters, so I did as well. I went and studied St. Augustine's book, on, which is essentially on poetry, called De Musica. For St. Augustine, though the poetic line is comprised of feet, uh, one does not create a poetic line by simply adding three, four, or five of the same type of foot together. Rather, the shape of the poetic line itself as a line determines the nature of the feet which are going to comprise it. The poetic line, like the melody in music, has a definite contour and shape to it which is recognizable and can be repeated and developed and varied. The higher level of existence, the line, determines the lower, the foot, and not the other way around. Let us demystify this big word, iambic pentameter. 
Penta comes from the word for five. Meter means measure. And the iam is a type of foot or measure. So iambic pentameter is a line of poetry that comprises five measures, each measure or foot of which is a short syllable followed by a long. Like Poe, St. Augustine recognizes that the short syllable must be exactly half the time duration of the long syllable, but you're going to run into trouble if you try to read poetry strictly that way. From fairest creatures we desire increase. Uh -uh. For Augustine, however, each foot need not necessarily be exactly an I am. An I am, which is a short and a long syllable, is the equivalent of three short syllables. And for Augustine, anything that adds up to the equivalent of three short syllables is admissible in a line of iambic pentameter. Thus, a line could include iams, and I'm going to read this in more strict time than should be done just to get the point. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, that's five iams. But you also have the trochee, which instead of a short followed by a long, is simply a long followed by a short. I'm going to read an example of trochaic tetrameter, another big word, but it just means four trochees. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. To my mind, the difference between iambic meter and trochaic meter is as simple as iambic meter starting on the upbeat from fairest creatures and the trochaic starting on the downbeat, once upon a midnight dreary. Augustine would also admit into a line of iambic pentameter a foot that was comprised of three short syllables. He had a name for it, and I've forgotten it now. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. In that case, both many a and Curious are those types of feet with three short syllables. And of course he would accept into his line the caesura, where a single syllable can fill an entire measure. Poe stresses the caesura as the most important foot, and when we come to Yenner, we will hear how Brahms stressed for Yenner the extreme importance of finding the caesuras when setting a poem. In the approach to scansion that emphasizes only stressed and unstressed syllables, the caesura is merely represented as a pause, as punctuation, and thus it's not uncommon to find one at the end of a line of poetry. Many lines of poetry end with a single syllable. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. And they often come as punctuation in the middle of the line. The opening line of Virgil's Aeneid is such a great example of a shape line of poetry, and I probably shouldn't even try to recite Latin, but here goes. I'm applying the timing to the syllables and the feet that St. Augustine uh, described. Arma varumque cano, troie qui primus ab oris. The pause between Cano and Troye is a caesura. Arma verumque Cano, Troye qui primus ab oris. By the second line, Virgil has landed you upon an anomaly. Poe, however, has a much more interesting conception of a caesura. Rather than a simple pause as dictated by punctuation, he has the idea of a single syllable that fills an entire foot, much like the way that a dotted half note would fill a measure in music in 3-4 time. He gives a very simple example. I have a little stepson of only three years old, with son being the caesura. 
For Augustine, the question of time is so important that he insists that if you have a poem in which the first several lines in each stanza or verse are of six feet and that the last line is of only three feet, then the reading of the last line must be slowed down to occupy the same amount of time as the lines of six feet. He gives an example, a poem where every single stanza or verse is shaped that way. And now we have the principle that we saw with the line and the foot taken to a higher level. Just as the line determined the foot and then not the other way around, now the stanza determines the line and not the other way around. It should not surprise us that as a result the lines and the feet become not less interesting but more interesting and more differentiated. An accomplished Shakespearean actor once informed me that when Shakespeare employs iambic pentameter in his plays, if the last line has only three feet instead of five, the time of the missing two feet must be filled by action on the stage. That seems me to be very similar to the principle identified by St. Augustine, although over a thousand years later. Edgar Allan Poe did come up with some quite beautiful musical scansions. He developed a concept of double short syllables, in other words, two syllables occupying the time of a short syllable, much like two eighth notes might occupy the time of a quarter note in music. He gives an example from a long forgotten contemporary, which if read as prose might go like this. Many are the thoughts that come to me in my lonely musing and they drift so strange and swift there's no time for choosing which to follow. For to leave any seems a losing. Poe demonstrates the poet's intent with a musical scansion. Many are the thoughts that come to me in my lonely musing, and they drift so strange and swift there's no time for choosing which to follow. For to leave any seems a losing. My listeners may be anticipating something. All of this makes a lot of sense if you look back to the early Greeks, for whom the term music came from the nine muses, and those muses included the muses of love poetry, epic poetry, drama, comedy, dance, melody, harmony, astronomy, justice. Here are some of them pictured here. The chorus in Greek tragedy danced across the stage as they sang poetry elucidating critical matters about the play. They had to know when to set their left feet down at the same time as they danced and thus the origin of the term foot in poetry. And thus the coordination of dance comes from the word chorus, choreography. Now I wish to address another musical aspect of poetry, the value of vowel sounds. All good singers know that vowels proceed from dark to light, oo, o, a, a, e, and that the center of focus shifts from the soft palate at the back of the mouth for oo, to the hard palate right at the center for a, and towards the teeth for e. Some of them also know that there is a science involved with this known as phonants. Good actors know this as well. Here we see the thrust stage at the Shakespearean Festival Theatre in Stratford, Ontario, Canada. Though good bel canto singing may develop these musical aspects of language to a higher degree, their origins are in spoken language. The late great William Hutt, a Canadian actor from an older generation who acted in more Shakespearean plays than anyone in his time, mostly on that stage that you just saw, and never went to Hollywood, understood this very well. Let's listen to what he had to say about these vowel values in an interview given in the last year of his life at the age of 86. Please note that while he's stressing the vowels in this example, he's also reading in beautiful poetic meter. Listen to this and tell me <clears throat> 
Ere the shard born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. That's an extraordinary sequence of, of vowel sounds that Shakespeare has put together because it's, it's, it, it's uh, Macbeth uh, thinking about the death of Banquo. He's, and his wife is sitting beside him. He's saying, ere the shard born beetle with his drowsy hum hath rung night's yawning peal, there shall be done a deed of dreadful. All those vowel sounds are, are uh, ominous sounding vowel sounds. And, and, that, that, and that, is, that, that is extraordinary writing match all those vowel sounds so that what you get from underneath it is this man's gone it's just on the verge of going berserk how do you hear that i would never have occurred to me Dear, listen to the listen listen to listen listen to the sounds yeah. i mean this is what what do we have uh, whether we whether we're classical actors or not what we have is the sound of our voices, right? <clears throat> and uh, and the sound that comes from from the from the language itself. You put all those vowel sounds together, and you've got a pretty ominous sounding concerto there. This is a different notion of sound from what popular music and recording studios use to cover up a paucity of ideas. Could all the advanced techniques in the world ever equal the sound of Mr. Hutt's single solo human voice reading that line? I will play a few more gems from the late Mr. Hutt's deep understanding of the musical aspects of Shakespeare. What, what, what makes uh, uh, rhythmic sense and also keeps, keeps uh, Shakespeare's uh, 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 demands alive. He makes enormous demands. A thought, a thought can be a long, long thought. What a rogue and peasant slave am I? Is it not monstrous that this player here, but a fiction, a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wan, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. You have to be able to breathe an aria in in opera. You yeah. have to be able to breathe an aria in Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare demands that you know there's a certain, there's a length of thought, there's a length of emotion. And uh, I mean, Guthrie always said that you should be able to say six uh, lines of Shakespearean verse on one breath. I think he's absolutely right. You should be able to do that. Doesn't mean you have to always just divide his speeches up in lines of six and just take one breath. But the point is that Shakespeare makes huge demands on on your technique. And the, 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 the example I gave of Hamlet, it sounds as if I'm doing it all in one breath because I'm thinking, thinking quickly, but I'm taking little breaths in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what I am doing is sustaining the thought until I get to the word nothing. Mm -hmm. And now I wish to bring up a third area of correspondence between music and poetry. For centuries, it was understood that punctuation in language corresponded to cadence in music. That understanding, however, depended on another understanding, that punctuation in language did not originate on paper with dots and commas. It originated in spoken language and existed largely to separate phrases from one another so that long sentences could become intelligible. The period was known as the stop, or full stop. The punctuation marks that we encounter in written language and that are so often explained within the context of written language have their origin in spoken language. They give us an idea of how things should be read out loud where to pause, how long to pause, inflection in the voice, all the things that make a very long thought intelligible. 
It's well known that music is organized in phrases, but how many people have heard of the concept of the musical period, which is equivalent to a paragraph in prose or a verse, stanza, or strophe in poetry? I will play a period from a very famous piece of instrumental music. It has four phrases to it, each of one with four measures in it. You can see it laid out that way, and thus bears a similarity to a quatrain in poetry. through these four lines we have a half cadence which might be seen as the equivalent of a semicolon. It's obviously not finished. At the end we have the equivalent of a full stop or a period. The thought is finished. The thought is completed and we eagerly await the next period to see where it will go. Now we can finally get around to Jenner. This is something that he understood that uh, Brahms emphasized to him. So let's read what he has to say. Brahms' first requirement was that the composer know his text in detail. By this, of course, he also meant that he should be completely clear about the poem's structure and meter. Then he would recommend that before composing a poem, I should carry it about in my head for a long time and should frequently recite it to myself aloud, paying careful attention to everything pertaining to declamation and especially noting the caesuras and later pausing while working this through. Imagine for a minute how Lewinsky would recite this poem, Brahms once said while discussing a song containing virtually no pauses. He would still pause for a moment here. It is especially pleasing to observe how in his own songs, Brahms knew how to treat these caesuras, how they were often a reverberation of what had come before or anticipate what is to follow. For example, von Evergeliebach. Side comment from the narrator, I don't know who Lewinsky was, but it's interesting to hear that there were people who recited poetry so well that even as meticulous a student of poetry as Brahms could learn from them. Back to Jenner. Brahms placed great value on these caesuras and their treatment, and in fact they are often an unmistakable sign that the composer is an artist who creates in confidence and freedom and not a dilettante poking around in the dark. Once the basic outline of the song had been examined, from all of these standpoints there followed discussion of its individual parts. Those places where punctuation is used in speech are said in music as cadences, and just as the poet puts together his sentences more or less firmly through sensible construction using commas, semicolons, periods, etc. as external signs, so likewise does the musician have available to him full and half cadences in manifold forms, acting as differences in degree for how loosely or tightly his musical phrases hang together. From this already the importance of cadences is quite evident, since it is through them that the construction as well as the proportioning of the individual parts is determined, and hence Brahms directed my special attention to them. It was here that one needed to especially understand the interaction of the three great musical factors of rhythm, melody, and harmony. To understand, for example, that the effect of a harmonically and melodically perfect cadence is weakened when it does not coincide with the rhythmic cadence, that in some cases this can be a grievous error, while in others it can be an effective means of linking phrases with one another 
that the weaker cadence has to precede the stronger one, and finally that the proportion of the individual parts must correspond to the text. Sometimes Brahms would show me passages where the cadence had been inadequately motivated rhythmically, and out of this he proved beyond all argument that the cadence had occurred here because the energy of my imaginative powers had given out. Yenner has touched on something very important in citing Brahms' insistence on these three great principles in music, melody, harmony, and rhythm, and whether all three coincide or not. Poetry is implicitly polyphonic. A single person reading a poem out loud can apply not just polyphony, but many aspects of polyphony, but it's not the same as having three singers sing it polyphonically. Music takes what is implicit in poetry and makes it explicit. I'm going to give you a very simple example of what Brahms is talking about, an excerpt from a minuet written by Mozart at, oh, I believe about the age of eight. There's one line in it that occurs twice. As an individual voice, it is a perfect cadence melodically and rhythmically. The first time we hear it though, it is complete, a complete cadence melodically and rhythmically, but not harmonically. The last time, it is complete harmonically, rhythmically, and melodically. And the final cadence, as you can hear, as Brahms described, is more powerful than the earlier one. This, of course, is an extremely simple example. It's not in leader, which Brahms and Jenner have been discussing. Uh, it's known to theory as a deceptive cadence, and someone might criticize me and say, well, that's just a well-known simple trick from Harmony 101. But I think it's more useful if we look at it the way that the three elements Brahms is talking about and how they intertwine, we might understand the deceptive cadence uh, in another way and understand the difference between how a great composer uses it and a student uses it. We can also gain insights into the importance of punctuation when we look at it from the other side, what Brahms described as a cadence that only uh, works in two of the three elements as coming from the lack of imagination of the composer. Uh, Shakespeare makes great fun of this. He has this rolling in the aisles in his Pyramus and Thisbe when a group of working men who have never attempted to present a play before do so but get very nervous in doing it. Prologue clearly means to say, our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here that you should here repent you. The actors are at hand. But he's so nervous that he gets his punctuation mixed up. All for your delight we are not here. That you should here repent you, the actors are at hand. Let's listen to a little bit of Mozart's musical joke. If you've heard it before, perhaps you may hear it with new ears. Is Mozart not making fun of composers who, though they have some technical training, are what Brahms describes as the people who lack the imaginative powers, lack the creative genius and the skill, the set of tools to take all these disparate elements of music and work them together Work, make them work together for the greater good as a whole without losing control, which is what happens here. The composer seems to have attempted a great finale and then suddenly remembers that he's not done. He's got to negotiate a recapitulation. <laughs> Back to the main theme.
I have read of music professors who profess not to get the joke. That might be a good test as whether you want to choose that fellow for your teacher or not. Let's return to Yenner. Whenever he discussed a song with me, the first order of the day was to investigate whether its musical form corresponded to the text throughout. He reproached errors in this regard with special severity as a lack of artistic sense or the result of inadequate penetration of the text. In general, he demanded that whenever the text permitted a strophic treatment, this should come into play. In order to achieve clarity about which texts were to be treated strophically and which not, he recommended a careful study of the collected songs of Franz Schubert, whose acute artistic sense in these matters is revealed even in his most unpretentious songs. There is not a single Schubert song from which you cannot learn something, said Brahms. At this point I have to take a moment and explain to my listeners exactly what a strophic poem is. The term verse means too many different things today, but one of the meanings is the sense of each separate verse uh, <clears throat> in a poem. The other term for this is also stanza. But in many poems you will see that the verses are not the same. They're not necessarily the same length, uh, and the same goes for the stanzas. A strophic poem is one in which each verse is exactly the same. The same number of lines, the same number of feet in each line, the same rhyme scheme. A very simple example would be many of the folk songs that we know. You are my sunshine, Red River Valley. The words are all strophic poetry in that each one of them is the same and can be set to the same melody. A more complex poem might have to be what is called through composed, that is varying all the way through, which is a much more difficult undertaking. Back to Yenner. The most rigorous form of strophic song is that in which the same melody is repeated for the poet's successive strophes, while the accompaniment also remains the same, as happens countless times with Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, and others. One of the most magnificent examples which takes the sole liberty of a non-repeated introduction at the beginning is Nea des Geliebten, Nearness of the Beloved, one of the most beautiful songs by Goethe and Schubert. A song born of yearning and words and tones. With regards to this song, it is not pleasant to imagine how one of those uncomprehending writers of so-called songs seduced by the wealth of images contained in the text, could most likely work out this poem musically. What a show we should see here! Schubert sets this text to a simple melody in the compass of a few measures. Yenner here is referring to a romantic tradition akin to what you know as uh, tone poems. The idea of taking the literal images in a poem trying to depict them musically and milking them for every amount of emotion you can get out of them. This leaves the poem as a whole with no unity, but simply a matter of dramatic effects. He contrasts that to Schubert using a melody of only a few notes, a few measures, and repeating it. Back to Yenner. But whoever thinks that this melody is in some way a composing out of the first strophe of the Goethe poem, according to which the rest of them can simply be chanted off, is quite mistaken. Oh no, this melody has welled up from the same single deep emotion from which flowed all the images which are so manifold and yet always say the same thing anew. It is a musical expression of what the entire poem left as an impression within the composer. And so we find that with each new strophe, as always with Schubert, it glows more fully and seems to say new things, because with the new text, the underlying emotion becomes increasingly distinct and is expressed with increasing intensity. This, of course, also requires that through the artistry of the musician, the melody fits perfectly 
with the individual words in the various strophes of the text, so that no dissonance arise, which would seriously disrupt the whole. Jenner is saying that the composer cannot simply design a melody that fits the first strophe of the poem and then just rattle it off for the rest of the strophes, but he has to take the entire poem as an entirety, as a whole, as a progression, a change into his mind and design a melody that is going to become ever more intense with each passing strophe and be the most beautiful in the very last strophe. Notice his interesting use of the word dissonance. He's not referring to the usual musical dissonance between intervals, but a dissonance between the melodic setting and any part of the poem. Just as an example, a dissonance might be where, say, the second line of the second strophe fit the music perfectly, but the same line in another strophe seemed at odds with the music. Eusebius Mandashevsky, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, was recommended to Yenner by Brahms as a teacher of strict counterpoint, and in fact Yenner did study strict counterpoint with the man. Mandashevsky was a contour, a singer, uh, and a composer, and he was also, he edited the complete songs or leader of both Schubert and Brahms. Yenner talks about what he learned from him. When my teacher Eusebius Mandzuski was working on his annotated edition of Schubert's complete songs, he showed me how Schubert had altered a melody which he had written to the words of the first strophe of the text in favor of a passage in a later strophe, and had also chosen this altered melody for the first strophe, despite the fact that the earlier version would have definitely fit better there. He could have opted to keep both melodic passages, but he was evidently dealing with a rigorous strophic song. And his artistic sense told him that even in the details, the effect had to intensify rather than flag. A perfect example of this is the aforementioned poem Nea des Geliebten, or Nearness of the Beloved. A man is traveling abroad and misses his loved one. Don't worry about the words. I'll go through them as we go along. Schubert published two different versions of this song. The second one is the only one we hear today, but a comparison of them shows some interesting things. He made significant changes in the piano part and the time signature, though not the key signature, but in the vocal part he only changed one note. Here is the second half of the first strophe from Schubert's first edition of this song, Nea des Geliebten. Now, here is the second half of the fourth and last strophe of Schubert's second version of this song, Nea des Geliebten. I can understand the singer changing the key from the original key, but why he sings these versions 1 and 2 in two different keys is beyond me. They're both in G-flat major originally. Although the piano part varies, there is only one note different in the vocal part. Since Schubert adhered to the idea that a strict strophic setting must employ exactly the same melody for all four strophes, 
He ends all four strophes of the first version with this melodic line. Here you hear it in the first strophe. The first version ends with the very last note being a sustained D flat, the fifth of the key. The last version ends with that D flat coming back down to the tonic, a G flat. And this is what Mandashevsky was talking about. The last words of the first strophe in Cavell and Malt worked much better with that long sustained note but Schubert put that dropping fifth into it because that worked much better with the last strophe, O Vest du Da, Oh I Wish You Were Here. And it's the effect of the development as a whole right to the end that is most important and you work backwards from that. Now a lot of this may not make sense at this point because we haven't studied the entire poem yet. So without further ado, let's listen to a couple of great artists. Even though it's recorded in 1952, I think they bring something really superior to it. Perform the entire uh, song, and I'll run the words by all the way through it. Wow, now I think I know why Jenner calls it a poem by Goethe and Schubert. I think the role of the poets is far often too underestimated in these leader 
even if they didn't directly collaborate. In their minds they did. There are many things that could be said about it, such as how the singer slows down in the third verse or starts out the fourth verse so powerfully, but I'll leave it to you. Uh, go back, I hope you go back and listen to it more than one time. There's so much to be learned from it. Think back now to that process whereby we described that the line determines the feet, not the other way around. The stanza determines the line, not the other way around. And now we see clearly that the development of the poem as an entirety orders all of these things from above. What might be seen as even above that is the poet and composer's intent, but one has to be careful with that. It could be an easy cop-out. The poet-composer has to have the kind of command to carry this out in the way that we just heard. Brahms advice to Jenner was to stick with theme and variations and strophic songs for the beginning. Even though we've described the enormous difficulty of doing this right, it has a certain advantage because it it binds the young composer in with lawfulness, with uh, necessity. You're not free to just roam around and do whatever you please. And in, until you have developed your capabilities, setting a young composer loose on a through composed song would be dangerous because there's so much that's arbitrary. How do, you, how do you know what to do? You're better off with the concept of freedom necessity and the challenge of actually creating beauty, of creating freedom within such a restrained framework is uh, the best. We'll hear a lot more about that in part two. Yenner also mentions in passing that the same principle applies to the rigorous setting of a strophic folk song. Well, wait a minute, how does that apply? In the Schubert leader, he is designing the melody according to the poem, but with a folk song, the poem and the melody are already composed. You're stuck with it. Sometimes it takes a great master to do the most simple thing. Brahms set hundreds of folk songs. He always kept the melody totally intact and managed to accomplish this type of change through his piano accompaniment. Not only that, he often changed the piano accompaniment part way through the piece. In the folk song we're going to examine, there definitely is such a process of transformation implied by the text, by the words, and thus it shows you the true beauty of folk songs, but it's hard to bring out simply by repeating the melody although the melody lends itself to that type of development. Brahms comes up with an ingenious accompaniment for the first three verses, and for the last two verses, changes the accompaniment and merely writes et vos langsamer, somewhat slower. It's up to the artist to take it from there, and these two do so magnificently.
I'm going to end by addressing one more important quality of strophic poetry. Yenner addresses the question of the varied strophic form. There are many types of it, but the most common is where all the strophes are set the same except for the very last one. And there's an irony involved because on one level all the strophes have the same number of lines, the same number of feet in these respective lines, the same rhyme scheme, yet there's also something in the last strophe that demands that it be set differently. I am going to use a well-known poem, Mondnacht, or Moon Night, by Eichendorf. Brahms said it as a young man, but it's Schumann's mature version that I'm going to use here. Let's see if we can determine what it is in the poem that demands a different setting for the last verse. I have not worked on this poem. You have to work on reciting a poem the same way as you do on reciting a piece of music. So I can't offer a very good reading. The first strophe, and again excuse my poor German and the poor translation. Es war, als hätte der Himmel die Erde still geküsst, dass sie im Blutenschimmer von ihm nur träumen musst. It was as though the sky had silently kissed the earth, that she, in shimmers of flowers, could only dream of him. Second strophe. Die Luft ging durch die Felder, die Ähren wogten sacht, es rauschten leis die Wälder, so sternklar war die Nacht. The air went through the fields, the corn husks gently waved, the wind through woods swished softly, so star clear was the night. And now the third and final strophe, and we have the advantage of being able to work backwards from Schumann's setting to get an idea of how to read it. Und meine Seele spannte weit ihre Flügel aus, flog durch die stillen Lande, als flüge sie nach Haus. And here we have a great irony. On the surface, everything about this strophe seems the same as the others. Twelve syllables to the first and third lines, eleven to the second and fourth, both of which are indented. Four lines to the strophe, similar rhyme scheme. Everything seems to be the same, yet there's something in the poem itself that demands that it be done differently. What could that be? Number one, the poet is now speaking in his own voice, in the first person, and my soul, my soul spread out its wings. In the first two strophes, he was describing what was happening in nature outside of himself. Now is how this has moved him. Now some critics might argue and say, well, the change comes from the difference in the meaning of the poem. Isn't that more important than all these musical things, uh, aspects that you're talking about? Well, as the Apostle Paul put it, all things work together for the good. And I hope we're discovering during the course of this presentation the degree to which these musical aspects of poetry and language are absolutely inseparable from what the poem means. For example, the vowel sounds. The last word of the last line in the first two strophes, both of them used bright vowels. Himmel, Felder. And appropriately, Schumann had the voice rise up into the head register uh, to sing that line. The last word in the third strophe, Spanta, is a much darker vowel, and Schumann changes the music so that it's sung in the middle of the human voice. There is also an metrical inversion. The rhythm here is three iams per line, and that means that each line should start with an unstressed or short syllable. But can you really say, Und meine Seele spannte weit ihre Flügel aus? Can you make weit wide a short syllable? Or do you have to say, 
und meine Seele spannte weit ihre Flügel aus. And the whole drive of that phrase is crucial. You could not really stress the importance of the poet speaking in the first person without the phrase that drives through that spanta vowel and into the metrical inversion of weit, wherein short syllable and unstressed syllable becomes a long stressed one. That metrical inversion continues on into the third line, flog durch die stillen Lande. Again, you couldn't really say flog durch. So it continues. The entire strophe has a drive to it that winds down at the end with as if flying to its own home. My soul flew through the silent lands as though flying home. I made my own translation for the last line of the second strophe. In German it is so sternklar war die Nacht, and I translated it as so star clear was the night, which no one else does. But I believe the strength of that line sets the stage for the transformation in the third strophe and Schumann picks up on that in the change in the piano accompaniment that he makes between the second and third strophes. Does this analysis account for the entirety of Schumann's creative process? Hardly, but I am certain that he took these matters into account and that it's on the right track. The study of poetry brings up the question of irony and ambiguity. Biblical fundamentalists object to the Bible being referred to as poetry. For them that means that it can mean anything that anybody wants it to mean and they correctly suggest that the meaning has to be definite but they insist on a literal meaning. The problem though is that literal readings are far more imprecise and open to manipulation than is poetry. Ambiguity in poetry is very precise. It's not swimming around in the dark. It means a choice between two very different things and it's the in-betweenness that allows the mind to play with the idea and discover the truth. None of us though can afford to be arrogant about owning the truth. I disagree strongly with the value-free education approach which says there really is no truth, you can't know truth, therefore everything is equal. I call it the Pontius Pilate approach. What is truth? Uh, and I wash my hands of it. Yet, truth is a process. Truth seeking is a process of discovery and we will always learn more and Although future discoveries don't negate discoveries today, what we hold on to as truth might now might seem inadequate compared to what we shall learn tomorrow. Truth is not a fixed state of perfection or a fixed body of knowledge. Therefore, we have to know that the truth-seeking process which we are undertaking is itself truthful. Are we truthful in the method? So please join me in listening to what might seem like a paradox, a truthful setting of a poem.
I said I would end with that piece, but the composer must be allowed a short coda. One of the other things that's infuriating about the way that poetry is taught in school is the insistence on the use of imagery. Not that imagery does not exist in poetry, we just saw some beautiful imagery in Eichendorf's poem, but the change was what mattered. But we're taught in school, well, if you're trying to describe a beautiful woman, then come up with all the images of sunsets on the mountainside and what her eyes can be compared to, what her lips can be compared to, etc. An example. Her blue eyes were as bright as the sun, blue as the sky, but soft as silk. And accordingly, when people recite poetry, they tend to get all starry-eyed. But none less than our chief poet, William Shakespeare, decided to satirize this obsession with imagery, and it's a funny poem. One pun that's important to understand, when Shakespeare says done, he spells it D-U-N, which is a dirty white color. Again, I haven't really worked at it, so I can't do it justice, but I think it's important to do it anyhow, so here goes. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her heads. I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belie with false compare. Brahms, Jenner, and I, as well as a host of others, will gladly meet you again in part two.